Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, so we're going to get started. Welcome to everybody. Uh, we have another great EBFA webinar lined up for you. And uh, very special welcome to those names that I see are repeat attendees. And if this is your first time tuning in for an EBFA webinar, very special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily. I am the founder of EBFA. I'm a podiatrist, a movement specialist, and now undertaking a lot of barefoot research. Uh, we have a very special educator guest today, uh, which I will or whom I will introduce in just a moment. If this is your first time again tuning in, the way that it works is that we will go through roughly a 30 minute webinar and then we will follow that with some Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can type them in into the questions box and then we'll go through that at the end. And then we actually have a new feature for 2013 is that all of our webinars are sponsored. So that means that by attending, you have the chance to win some free swag. And this webinar is sponsored by Foot Scrubs, footscrubs.com. They make some cute little scrubs with some feet on them. So if you are in the market to win some scrubs, all you have to do is answer the pop quizzes correctly. The first person who answers it correctly wins the scrubs. All webinars can be found on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kevin Moore, who is actually a repeat guest educator for our EBFA webinars, had great response, very intelligent guy, and I'm very honored to have him be with us today. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks very much, Dr. Emily. I'm really pleased to be back. So Kevin is an educator, Pilates instructor, who I met in Hong Kong, uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago now? No, one year ago. And I was so oh, impressed by him. Yeah, about a year ago, yeah. A year ago, yeah. And I was so impressed by him and his, the way that he looks at human movement and biomechanics, which you guys will get a, a teaser of that as well. Um, Kevin is a barefoot training specialist, master instructor for EBFA. And he's been in the Pilates industry for over eight years. And he's also the founder of his Ream Body blog, which has amazing articles on it. Check it out at reambody.me. So without further delay, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Well, I've, I've been really looking forward to this uh, webinar in particular. The material I'm going to talk about today uh, has had a really direct effect on my daily practice. And how I how I work with people and I've been able to get some great results thinking of things this way um, and and one of the ways I arrived at some of these conclusions was by looking at uh, looking at joint function from a from a maybe a little bit less of a medical or a biological perspective and more from a physics perspective right trying to build up our understanding of the joints uh, from the principles that govern all motion and then seeing how that applies to the to the materials that make up our joints. And if we'll take a look at the next slide here. Um, uh, you may have heard this before, you know, that in, in academic circles people argue about this, you know, biologists, uh, you know, uh, chemists will tease biologists, the biologists apply chemistry, and then physics uh, physicists tease chemists because chemistry is just applied physics. And since joints are really just mechanisms that distribute force, we'll start by looking at the forces. And so, uh, to get there, we're going to look, we're going to keep fresh in our minds the, the three laws, Newtonian laws of motion. First, of course, that bodies at rest or in motion will tend to remain so. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. And, of course, uh, for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. And then in addition to that, because what is a bone if not a lever, uh, we'll also be talking a little bit about the principles of leverage. Uh, and one of the things I'll mention here right now is that one of the things that makes leverage work at all is that you're, you get to borrow some of that chemical energy from the lever itself. And in terms of bone and the structures that make up bone, there's actually some pretty cool stuff that takes place at the molecular level. We won't go too far into that, but just know that you are that we're counting on the chemical energy inside the lever to help create that leverage. So um, we're going to use the gate cycle as our reference point today. Because uh, I think that as we're looking at as we're looking at how joints transmit force. Um, oh, ah, before we get there, however, let's have a little quiz. Let's see what we know. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so again, our quizzes, and this will be just a little teaser into the uh, the gate cycle. Again, sponsored by footscrubs.com is during the initial contact phase of gait, the ideal foot position is in an inverted position. Name the three subtalar joint inverters. So which three muscles are the subtalar joint inverters? And we're talking extrinsic muscles. So if you are the first person to answer this correctly, then you will win the foot scrubs. All right, so again, if you are able to. All right, post tib and tib, excellent job. So we have Carl, congratulations. The answer is soleus, posterior tibialis, and tibialis anterior. Excellent job. All right, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And actually, that question was timely because we're going to talk about initial contact right now. Um, so uh, from a physics perspective, right, once you make initial contact, and again, we're, we're, we're assuming that we've started the gait cycle kind of mid-gait, so we're already in motion. Um, the, the swinging foot has hit the floor. It already had forward momentum. And then once you have the strike at the heel, or once you have a, a contact with the floor, what was forward momentum has to change a little bit. Suddenly, the, the, the length of the foot begins to act more like a diameter. Right? It's going to rotate because that the, the ground reaction forces against the heel have changed the, pl the plane of motion. So what's interesting about that, in particular at the next slide here, I've got a diagram showing uh, uh, some of the principles of rolling resistance, right? what, how, what, how wheels work. And if you think of the contact point of the calcaneus in the floor as being like a tiny little wheel, then that uh, loading, or that, sorry, that leading resultant force, you can see the little diagram there, uh, against the center of gravity of the wheel creates a net opposing torque. And what's cool about that little net opposing torque is that the foot can keep moving in that rotation, the same rotational direction uh, uh, going forward into um, uh, loading response. But that little net opposing torque starts to set up some of our next joint reactions, in particular dorsiflexion. Uh, and this is where um, uh, we'll move, move forward into loading response, and this is where things start to get really cool, if you ask me. Because uh, in loading response, the you know, ground reaction forces, uh, you know, there's, there's basically two types, right? There's the normal force, which is when acceleration due to gravity starts pulling the body against the ground, and the ground doesn't collapse. It means the ground's exerting back up on you, an, an equal and opposite force. But in addition to that, there's also friction. Right? And there's also now this rolling resistance that we get from the calcaneus seeing the floor. And the, if you add up all those vectors, you get a moment of eversion created by ground reaction forces. And this is one of the, one of the to me, the super cool things, you know, that we think of eversion as something that our everters do. Right? We just talk about inverters, everters, you know, the perineals, et cetera. They, they create eversion. But in fact, when you go into loading response, there's, there is a free force creating eversion for you, and your everters get to react to that rather than create it, which is a much more efficient way of, of ambulating. So if ground reaction forces are producing an eversion moment, and we get, to, we get to use that for our own propulsion, what does eversion create? Right? So let's move ahead to the next slide, and we'll see. Uh, I've set up a couple of different angles for you to take a look at. Um, uh, the ligamentous attachments between the calcaneus and the tibia. And, um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a martial arts background, right? So if, if you want to know where force is moving, looking at ligaments is a really easy way to do it. Because, you know, in martial arts, when you're, when you're doing a joint lock, uh, the, only, the reason joint locks work is because when you've maximized the tension on a ligament, every little bit of force applied beyond that maximum will cause the bone to move quickly and without any resistance, partially because the body knows that, that you, you break a ligament that doesn't really heal all that well. Uh, but but it's, it has to do with the direction of force. And if you lock out a ligament and apply a little bit more force, it, it moves automatically. So by looking at these ligament attachments between the calcaneus and the tibia, you can see that when the, calcane calcaneum, when the calcaneus uh, everts, 
it's going to drag against the medial malleolus in such a way to create internal rotation. And the, uh, as you look at those attachments, the, the strongest moment is clearly in the internal rotation direction. And uh, it creates this kind of whipping action, if you will. You know, the calcaneus actually makes a pretty good lever. Uh, the, its mass and its geometry mean that, that as it everts, it has a really very good leverage against that medial malleolus. And it, once again, we have internal rotation that's being created by a free force rather than being created by internally ro internal rotators. They just get to respond. And, you know, by the way, if you ever, uh, if you're as much of a geek about this stuff as I am, and you ever have a free hour or two, following the ligamentous attachments between the, the bones of the foot is a really fascinating thing to watch because if, if you think of each ligament as being a little arrow dictating where force is traveling, it's a, it's a really fun exercise. So, you know, if you have some way of looking into that, take a little time one of these days. Uh, so, um, oh yes, yeah, so let's move on to the next slide here. So, we have the eversion. We have the eversion creating internal rotation. We have our net opposing torque assisting some dorsiflexion. And as that everting and dorsiflexing and internally rotating are all maximized, we find ourselves in terminal stance. Uh, now, this is where we're going to start getting into the knee, because that's the whole reason why you're here, right? We're going to talk about uh, assessing the knee. Because during that period, wherein the subtalar joint is everting, and uh, uh, the, the ipsilateral femur is extending. And that extension has a strong moment of lateral rotation. And you know, as anyone who's uh, heard my webinars before, I'm way into the glutes. I think the glutes are a super cool uh, set of structures. And um, you know, any time I can tie back into them, I can. So uh, we have that strong moment of lateral rotation. And it is this combination of internal rotation at the distal tibia and a moment of external rotation up at the proximal femur that really allows the knee to work as we need it to work. And to see how that, how that, uh, how that works, we'll take a look at the next slide. We're going to introduce the meniscus and the popliteus. You know, for people that, um, how do I say, you know, part of the introduction to this webinar was about how you know we, we we're getting more and more aware that we need to look at joints on, in terms of their three-dimensional movement and how the knee seems to kind of lag behind i think in people's perspective we still think of it like a hinge or talk about it like a hinge but take a look at that meniscus if that's not built for rotation i don't know what is you know there's there's so much force traveling in circles um uh, in that little piece of structure and I've really become quite impressed with the meniscus as a structure as I've been researching some things for this presentation, actually. So, um, but the first thing I want to point out, popliteus, popliteus does not have a very strong moment, even in rotation. And, uh, but when we look at where it actually attaches, um, we, we see that contraction of the popliteus actually moves the, the posterior arch of the lateral meniscus. And, the reason why this is necessary is because the, the lateral meniscus is, is pretty firmly connected to and follows the movements of the medial condyle of the femur. And if the knee were to flex, hypothetically, without any rotational component, the posterior arch of the lateral meniscus would be crushed between the tibia and the femur. But luckily, there, there is a rotational component. Papateus uh, originates at the lateral surface of the lateral condyle of the femur and into the posterior arch of the lateral meniscus. And this means that in the presence of um, tibial internal rotation and femoral external rotation, there is a simultaneous co-contraction of popliteus, and that posterior arch gets retracted and drawn out of harm's way. And, and this again goes into this, this thing I was talking about before where the popliteus doesn't create that motion, it responds to that motion, it doesn't have anywhere near the necessary moment to move these giant bones into their rotation, but as soon as they're rotated, the fibers can just take up the slack and move that arch. And um, of course, if, if, if we don't have enough of either of those motions, the, either the tibia or the femur, you know, the popliteus can still, it can still get the job done, but it has to work really hard to do it. And you know, all kinds of kind of secondary problems can arise from that, bursitis and tendonitis and, and, and inflammation-based uh, problems can arise from that. <clears throat> 
So if we looked at the next slide here, the medial meniscus is a slightly different story, right? There is no, there is no muscle crossing over the medial meniscus like we get the palpateus. Also, the medial meniscus is responsible for about 15% more of the, the surgery requiring um, uh, uh, intervention than the lateral meniscus. And this means that the position of the posterior arch of the medial meniscus has to be affected by something else. And as it turns out, again, if we follow those ligaments attachments, that posterior arch is directly affected by the femur, right? The, the, the uh, fibers of the medial ligament of the knee attaching to the medial meniscus uh, are, are significantly shorter going to the femur than they are to the tibia. And the, the moment arm there is way stronger. So when the femur laterally rotates relative to the tibia, the, the ligaments uh, associated with that motion just draw that posterior arch the, of the medial meniscus along with it, right? The, you, don't, you don't need a muscular co-contractor because the, the ligaments already do it for you. The force is already traveling in that direction. And so this, uh, this is kind of interesting to me. So this means that if you're in a situation where, for whatever reason, you lack uh, either, you know, glute strength or, or um, kind of mechanical advantage to create femoral external rotation, or if you lack dorsiflexion and therefore can't internally rotate your tibia or, you know, whatever, there's a million things that could cause that. It means that your lateral meniscus is to some degree being protected by your papateus, right? And so this, this lack of um, coiling in the leg will tend to injure your papateus before it injures your meniscus, but the medial meniscus doesn't have that, that benefit. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we see more medial meniscus uh, injuries. So um, the other thing to, to note now is that if we move ahead, right, if we, if we move ahead to the next phase of stance, the next thing that we see happening after terminal stance is a bend to the knee, right? We're going to start getting a swing. Ah, but before we see any swinging, we're going to answer a few more questions. All right. So real quick, I'm going to jump in there with a question so that the attendees can win some free scrubs with some feet on them. First person answers correctly gets the foot scrubs swag. So we have during the stretch shortening cycle, what is the name of the phase when the muscle switches from an eccentric contraction to a concentric contraction? Again, what is the name of that phase? Type that question in and we will see who is the first person correct. I apologize, I just had a technical issue. First person to answer that correctly, Again, we'll win some foot scrubs. What is the name of the phase as the foot switches from eccentric to concentric? Okay, anyone know you have a few more moments and then we will move on. This involves an isometric contraction. Kevin, do you know the answer? I'm sorry, the, the, oh, the name of the phase? From eccentric to concentric. From eccentric to concentric. You know, I don't know the name of that phase. It's the amortization phase, which is an isometric contraction. So now we learned something else new. All right, so moving on, Kevin, here we go. All right, so we, were, we, we just finished our uh, what we just finished? We just finished terminal stance. That's right. We're heading into pre-swing, and we just noted that uh, in terminal stance, the the femur and the tibia coiling in opposite directions protects the meniscus. Right. So we now have those posterior arches pulled back nice and snug. They can't be harmed by the condyles of the femur. So now the knee is free to swing. And I don't know if um, if anyone listening today had a chance to uh, look at the article that I wrote and that went into the EBFA newsletter um, about spear throwers, about this this thirty thousand year old technology that, that humans are using to throw spears, uh, and uh, uh, I was so excited about that article because um, uh, the the technology is so cool, but it's so simple. You know, the the idea that when you uh, use leverage to compress 
a fibrous tensile structure, right, like a piece of wood or a bone, um, uh, if you have any disparity in mass, right, if one end is more massive than the other end, it means that the force applied to that object will accelerate one end more than the other. Remember, F equals MA, right? So uh, the human tibia, uh, it, for that matter, the human femur is the same way, but one end is much more massive than the other. So as you go from terminal stance to pre-swing, and the leverage provided by the foot starts creating this, this throw to the tibia, the tibia begins, you know, propelled forward, that knee bend carries with it or has to channel quite a bit of force. Right? The tibia flies forward with no small amount of energy. And if the, if the femur and the tibia aren't lined up, aren't coiled properly, then that initial knee bend going into pre-swing is going to start kind of freaking out your meniscus. <laughs> and your, the, the, you know, the various tissues around the knee will start to conspire to prevent the knee from bending. Because if it does, with too much force, you start to get meniscus breakdown. And, um, and, and you could trace a lot of bursitis and tendonitis problems back to that same idea. And what's more, and what I see actually more frequently is that, uh, in particular, like with the, with the dominant leg, right, whichever leg happens to be the tighter of the two, uh, the, sim the knee simply won't bend, right? And you end up swinging an entire leg forward, which is a really poor use of leverage, rather than swinging a bent knee, which is a much better use of leverage. Uh, and then finally, if we, if we go to the last uh, slide here. So uh, as we're talking about this disparity in mass, <clears throat> one of the points that I make in my article about spear throwers and how spear throwers are very much like ankles is that um, a spear thrower, you know, when you're, using, when, you're, when you're throwing or when you're using that little lever to throw the spear, it's, it's linear, right? You're looking for a bow in the shaft of the spear. It's very linear. And that works just fine. But uh, tibias are way cooler than that because they coil, right? Tibias coil. Uh, we've already noted that, that the eversion moment produced by ground force, forces during loading response uh, utilizes the leverage that already exists in, via the geometry of the calcaneus. And it's strong. It's a strong moment. Um, the distal end of the tibia is significantly less massive than the proximal end of the tibia. So that means that when I apply this strong uh, internally rotating moment to that distal end, the proximal end necessarily doesn't rotate quite as fast. And the disparity in that rotation means that the bone must coil. It may not be a lot, but the modulus of bone is such that you don't need to move very far. You don't need to coil very much to store a huge amount of energy. You know, and the femur is the same way, right? The femoral head is less massive than the uh, uh, com combined um, distal condyles of the femoral, of the femur. And so when you get that, that laterally rotating moment up at the femoral head, that condyle end doesn't rotate quite as fast. And what's really cool about that is that once you've got both of these bones, literally the bones themselves, coiling, storing energy, the uncoiling portion, wherein all of that stored potential energy turns back into kinetic energy, isn't driven by muscles. Yes, muscles assist the process. Yes, muscles help store the energy. They help kind of guide the force. But it's not created by the muscles. And so much of the dysfunction that I see and work with every day has everything to do with um, kind of preempting the free forces you get from moving around and adding a bunch of your own. Right, so kind of pre-contracting, squeezing too hard too early, and and kind of cutting yourself off from all the free energy available to you simply through gravity. Because you know, if you think about it, uh, <laughs> evolving on a planet that has gravity, but evolving so that that gravity is your enemy and not a source of energy, is pretty poor design. <laughs> uh, so you know, it, it's it's like being allergic to water. That's that would be a that would be a, a bad choice for, a, for an organism, right? So, we, But we use this gravity to help coil up those bones. And when they uncoil, you don't need so much muscle to do it. And uh, I would say probably the dysfunction that I spend most time fixing these days is an overabundance of lateral rotation in the tibia. 
because if you're not getting that un, if you're never getting the co the internal rotation, the coil, which allows you to store energy in the bone, it means you're not getting the uncoil. You're not getting the release of that potential energy back to kinetic, and that means that you're using too much muscle. You're using too much uh, lateral rotator. Using too much inverter, and and that becomes a ratchet, right? Because it never it never um, goes the other direction. And every time you take a step, it needs to go just a little bit further in that lateral rotation direction. And pretty soon the meniscus can't protect itself, and pretty soon you know, all kinds of stuff goes wrong as a result of that. So, uh, yeah, as Emily mentioned, Pilates, uh, my, my kind of rehab method has always has been Pilates for a while. But the, the, the method that you use, this is kind of a big message of, of the work that I do, the method that you use is not terribly important. If it's Pilates, fantastic. If it's yoga, wonderful. Weightlifting, martial arts, Qigong meditation, it really, it doesn't matter. As long as you understand the relationship you're trying to get. If a client you see, if you suspect that they're having a problem getting the femur to laterally rotate relative to the tibia, there's a million ways you could address that. Manual manipulation, acupuncture, uh, active isolated stretching, you know, what, like anything, anything. You just have to know what relationship you're looking to accomplish. And, um, and I think that's pretty powerful. You know, you, you, you don't have to buy into a particular method. You just have to know what you're looking for. So uh, for more information about uh, uh, some of the concepts I've discussed here, you can visit my blog because I guess I've written articles about some of these things already and it may help to fill in some of the gaps of what I couldn't get to today in 30 minutes but um, uh, you can take a look there and then also the, the sources and the papers I've used to get some of the pictures and information for today's webinar uh, I'll put those things up as well on the blog and you can take a look and follow them if you like actually the one uh, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery where I got those pictures of the uh, the medial ligaments of the knee and the uh, uh, meniscus. That's actually a kind of a fun article to read because the, the, the author, you know, it may just be like, you know, medical medical text, but the author totally comes off like a grumpy old man and he's, he's constantly kind of getting mad at younger doctors for not paying enough attention, which is kind of funny to me to listen to. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a good paper. So I'll, I'll post the information there for everyone to see. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. That's, um, I feel like everybody's going to have to listen to it again, especially the, the <laughs> physics. <laughs> like some people are very, you know, I go to conferences and when people start talking about like graphs and, you know, equations, you know, like the, the technical people, are like, yeah, I love it. And then, you know, I like, you know, crayons and color books and, you know, so it's a little, <laughs> little different, but amazing, amazing information that again, um, looking at the knee and energy transfer, transfer the gait cycle, possible injury patterns from um, this coiling that you're talking about, I think is, is definitely awesome. Um, so we have one more flash quiz, and then we have the Q&A for any questions that you may have for Kevin. So last question is, when we compare the running strike pattern between the midfoot and the heel, Wait, let me start again. When we compare the running strike patterns between a midfoot and a heel strike, what biomechanical movement does the midfoot striker bypass, which means that there are often less injuries? So if you're if you're looking at the biomechanical pathway um, between a midfoot strike and a heel strike, there's a certain step that the midfoot striker bypasses, and this is why you see a lot less injuries in a midfoot runner compared to a heel striker. This reminds me of something I want to talk about when you're done, by the way. This is a cool, cool concept. Oh, Susanna, congratulations. You got it correct. It is pronation, or you could have answered eversion as well. So pronation or eversion. Um, again, for those who study the midfoot or the barefoot strike patterns, because you're landing on the midfoot in an inverted or supinated position, you do not go through the full pronatory step, which means those who have shin splints, post-tib issues, and uncontrolled uh, flat foot would be um, at an advantage if they did a midfoot strike. So congratulations. And Kevin, uh, if you wanted to add something, you can. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, I was talking before about um, tracing force by following ligaments, um, and uh, one of the cool things that I was kind of been playing with recently is by noting that uh, I believe it's the oh, which ligament is it? Uh, Calcaneo navicular. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the the ligaments attachments between the calcaneus and the navicular bone are really fascinating because as the uh, they're kind of tethered to each other such that when the as the heel rolls from inversion to eversion there's this there's this uh, kind of constant tension held between the calcaneus and the navicular bone so that the navicular bone can turn kind of in tandem with the with the calcaneus uh, and it was a it's a relationship I haven't really kind of expressly noticed before but I thought it was really cool, and it, it occurred to me that that in midfoot striking, one of the ways that that that, that navicular rotation is one of the ways that you manage eversion and, and inversion, right? If you never if you're never striking the ground, you don't you don't get the same ground force pattern affecting the calcaneus itself, but you do get that ground force pattern affecting the navicular bone. And if the navicular bone has a ligaments attachment to the calcaneus, then you can still drive that turbine from the same forces just through a different bone. I just think it's a super cool process, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, it's, it's really looking at, um, uh, that's why I uh, focus on the benefits of barefoot kind of impact or barefoot training is that impact forces and ground reaction forces are actually your friend. You just need yeah. to train the body to efficiently move to it, and that's through the joints, joint coupling, fascia, and ligaments. So, um a lot of people muscle their way through it, which is exactly what you had said. So you see that tibiofemoral external rotation. And those are like all the injuries I see as well as people are muscling their way through the gait cycle versus it being this yeah. load unload that's just efficiently coiled and uncoiling. So, um, and, and of course, uh, all of this presupposes that during loading response, you've had the, the, proper intrinsic activation to help set up the forefoot to be even to even be able to handle that turbine twisting mm -hmm. um, you know which which again gives further support the idea that if that it, you know when you're when you're not barefoot that delay in the loading response sets up this chain reaction which doesn't allow you to do anything properly <laughs> correct correct and if you also strike in the ground in an inverted position which is how we are supposed to do it based off of that other question as well is it's that moment from inversion to eversion that gives you this, that coiling. So, or initially right. that coiling. So um, patients or clients who strike in an everted position, there's no way that they can just, because they're going from the position that they're supposed to be transitioning into that there's no load. So, right. or no kind of reactive coiling in that load. So I think that's, that's a great point that you, you made as well. So there is a question. Um, okay. So you mentioned that the most frequent issue you treat is excessive lateral tibial rotation. How do you assess mm -hmm. and treat this in your practice? Um, well, first of all, it's it's frequently associated with inversion, and um, so when I have somebody standing, there's there's kind of two positional cues I can look for as I as I watch them stand. First of all. Um, the relative ease with which they enter dorsiflexion or if they're already standing in plantar flexion uh, of the ankle. So if they're, if they're standing in plantar flexion of the ankle, uh, that already gives me a cue. Also, hyperextension of the knee would be kind of an immediate uh, tell that they're too far laterally rotated at the tibia. I also have a set of manual release techniques that I use on the foot. and. Um, you know, and how about this? Whether whether or not a person was laterally rotated the tibia, these these particular techniques are very kind of relaxing and releasing for the muscle of the foot. And so, often with a first time client, I will have them stand, have them note a few of the sensations that they feel while they're standing, and then I'll do that little release technique. It takes about five minutes, and then have them stand again, and if and then have them tell me how it feels to stand after having done that, and if their response to me is that they're shocked to find how much flatter or more grounded their foot feels, then I know that what they've been experiencing is a, a push of the weight to the outside edge of their foot. 
you know, because isn't that a, such a common thing that that in this in this muscular in this muscling through of Emily just talked about in this muscular drive to have bigger arches because people seem to think bigger arches are always better. Uh, uh, pushing the weight to the outside of the foot is something people even do conscious. I have a, a, a triathlete, high level triathlete that I work with right now, who um, for years consciously pushed his foot out to the outside edge because he thought bigger arches would mean he could run faster. And and so to answer the question, the positional cues of standing plantar flexion or knee hyperextension, and then the sen and then the feedback cue of releasing the ankle into what would be more internal rotation of the tibia and then seeing if how the client reacts to that. If they don't feel much, I know it wasn't much of a problem, but if it was a problem, they'll immediately feel that their feet feel really weird and really flat. And that tells me that's where they need to go. Excellent. Great question. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, let me see if... Um, See, so you have, if you want to just remind everyone about your your blog and your, a couple of the articles that you put on there, because they're very interesting. Yeah, um, well, again, the one that relates most directly to what we're talking about today was this one about um, uh, these ancient spear throwers, and I know that may seem kind of a weird way to approach it, but, you know, again, I think that building up an understanding of joints by understanding physics is really important. You know, you have, you, you not enough just to know the names everything you have to know why why it works you know why why does it work and um, so I, I do a pretty thorough breakdown of the physics that go into you know how you can use leverage to throw a spear further and then point out how the same concepts of leverage are applied to the uh, tibia and the ankle I also have a couple of a uh, couple of articles up it's kind of a, it's a series that I call relationships are complicated <laughs> and um, and it has to do with uh, uh, just looking at the way joints interact with each other. Because I found that um, looking at joints in isolation is typically not that helpful. And it's, it's, by following the, it's by following the way energy flows from one joint to the next that I can really get a better sense of how people are moving and how to make them move better. And so those two articles, uh, uh, the first one is about trying to, you know, right now our view of, of joint movement follows this proximal distal pattern, right, that we think of the, of the center of gravity, and then that uh, we, we, we call the proximal end the point that is closer to the center of gravity, we call the distal end the one that's further from that, and we, and we tend to think of, of, you know, proximal movement affects distal movement, and for the upper body, I think that works just fine, but for the lower body, since, you know, as we discussed here today, you know, the foot is the aperture by which force enters your skeleton. And so it really makes more sense to think of the most proximal, the most, you know, important, if you might call it that way, point of the body being, you know, the ball of the great toe, right, right where you meet the floor. And then everything else would be proximal or be sort of distal from that. I think that makes much more sense in terms of the way force flows through the body so that it's... Uh, I'm not advocating for any kind of dramatic change to medical terminology. I'm just saying as a way of thinking about things, it's very useful. And so I have an article about that. And then most recently I've been talking about um, stretching. Because, uh, you know, I, in many circles, people are, have totally kind of gotten on board with the idea that the whole the concept of stretching is is kind of a, you know, 70s thing. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a bit outmoded. You know, we don't, we don't stretch stretch much anymore in like a passive way and expect that to really do much for us. We now know that that eccentric elongation is a very active thing. You know, there's current flowing through a muscle that's acting eccentrically and that current is really important. And a muscle doesn't does not fail to elongate because there's anything wrong with the tissue. The muscle fails to elongate because the because it's being required to do something that prohibits it from elongating. And and uh, but despite the fact that I think this is getting more well known in my kind of recent practice, I bumped into a lot of people that that um, are still are still using kind of passive, painful, uncomfortable stretching as a way to try to relieve their pain, and then they're irritated or shocked when it's not working. So I, I wrote I wrote this article talking about why stretching is not really the answer. Um, 
and that you know positional modification is is, is the answer. Um, um, yeah, and so I will and I will continue. You know, I, I often choose what to write in that blog based on just kind of what I'm seeing on any given week and kind of what excites me. But certainly, if if any of the listeners here or anybody else uh, has a particular topic that they'd like to see kind of me address in in, in my particular style, I, I would be more than happy to consider um, uh, requests, you know, for research and breakdown because really the research is is super fun for me. So. Uh, if anybody has any requests for something they'd like to see done in kind of the re-embody method, I would, I would be happy to do that. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so we have one more question if you could answer um, sure. just in a quick way. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is one of the attendees said, I started mentally connecting frontal hip issues I've seen with gait restrictions due to knee issues. For example, mm -hmm. the swinging the whole leg forward like you mentioned. What are the most common yeah. hip issues that you would see from this? Oh man, great question. Um, well, first of all, uh, the way I look at this, it, I frequently see it in terms of a dominant leg and a non-dominant leg. And, and you know, for most of us, well, for most everyone I've ever seen, it's you know the right leg is dominant leg, left leg is non-dominant, but it really doesn't matter which one we're talking about. Um, and because you've only got two legs, <laughs> and your body. Your, your, your body is going to use at least one of them to make sure you don't fall over. Uh, and so whichever one is your dominant leg, well, I'll use the right for our example today. Um, uh, if you're having a problem getting that tibial femoral coiling and the meniscus doesn't feel protected, but you still have to bear weight on something, it means that in your dominant leg, the muscles that restrict the bending of your knee will tend to be overactive. And as this person just mentioned, you'll start to see that big, heavy, lumbering swing of that, of that dominant leg. But that also means that um, when the knee is supposed to be bending and it's not, the right hip or the dominant hip is going to remain elevated relative to the non-dominant hip. And this is something I see constantly because then that elevation, uh, in an effort to, to find a new uh, pattern of balance, that elevation turns into uh, rotation, forward rotation. So now you have a right hip, which was getting higher because the knee wouldn't bend, and your body couldn't handle that for very long, so it started to rotate the hip forward to find a new center of gravity. And so now you've got a right hip, which is always leading the left hip by a little bit. You know, you're kind of dragging the left leg behind you and swinging the right one forward. It's kind of an Igor-type walk, <laughs> uh, and it's at, at its most extreme. Um, and of course that rate, that elevated right hip then leads to a, you've got a super tight tensor fascia lata, you've got a super tight uh, QL on the right side, um, which leads to an inhibited glute on the right side, which means that every time you sit down, you're, you're putting undue pressure on the sacroiliac joint. I mean, you could just follow, you could follow that pattern to tons of stuff. But I think it's very astute what this person just mentioned, that, that the lack of a bending knee does immediately affect the, the relative position of the hip. But I find it, it's in terms of elevation and forward rotation. Excellent. Great. Thank you um, for answering that. And thank you for the awesome webinar, um, which mm, I will pleasure to again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, as always, you can find our webinars archived on youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. Again, check out Kevin's blog, reambody.me or M-E. And I will see everybody next month where we have Dr. Perry Nicholson of Stop Chasing Pain. And he's doing some primal rehab. So if you're into a lot of that primal concept, you will love mm. next month's webinar. So sign up on ebfafitness.com. And everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks, everyone.